The following program was made possible by the generosity of those who have determined to hold fast to the true Roman Catholic religion, as expounded by the Roman Catholic Church before the disasters of Vatican II and the so-called New Mass. If you would like this program to continue, please be ready to pledge financial support when you are asked later in the program. Welcome to What Catholics Believe. I'm your host, Jim Erling. The topic of today's show is Sede Vagantism. With me to discuss this topic is Father William Jenkins of Immaculate Conception Church, where only the traditional Latin Mass is offered. Father, welcome to the program. Thank you, Jim. Um, Father, this issue of uh, Sede Vagantism, uh, I, I think, can be described as, as one of the main issues that uh, divides and that there are multiple opinions um, uh, on, on this particular issue among traditional Catholics themselves or those that would identify themselves as traditional Catholics. And then, of course, being the question of um, is the Sea of Peter occupied or is it uh, vacant? Um, this can be very confusing for a lot of people within uh, the uh, traditional movement. Um, what is a person to do or how does one sort out uh, what it, I think you would acknowledge is a fairly difficult and complicated subject? It is. It is a very difficult subject and very divisive, too. Uh, just a word of explanation. Sede vacante is in the ablative case in uh, Latin, and it has to do with a time when there is no pope. Uh, these times occur between the death of one pope and the election of another. And there have been extended periods of time in the church's history when uh, there was no new pope elected after a pope had died. For example, in the 1200s, there was almost a three-year period uh, from the death of one pope to the election of another. Uh, there has also been uh, a period of great confusion in the church when there seemed to be multiple popes. Of course, there could only be one true pope. But there is what is called the Great Western Schism in the 1300s, when one pope was elected, then many of the cardinals who elected him repudiated him and elected another pope, uh, someone else who claimed to be the pope. And then uh, years later, as this dragged on, there was an effort to resolve this problem of two different claimants to the papacy by having the two who, uh, let's say, who were successors, one would die in each line and then another would be elected and you had these two lineages following side, side by side, one in, uh, one in Rome and one in Avignon. And then uh, some people tried to resolve the issue by having the two of Avignon and Pro Rome resign and have another one elected in Pisa. Well, yes, there was one elected in Pisa at a council, but the other two did not resign, so then you had three. And the allegiance of the Catholic people was, was torn. But one thing you did not have at this time was difference in religion because all of them kept the same faith and kept the same Catholic religion. So all of the people were following the same faith, believing the same faith, and, and practicing the same religion. Uh, it was so confusing at that time that there were great saints who did not agree as to who was the true pope. Uh, St. Catherine of Siena acknowledged the Pope in Rome, who was the successor of the, the original Pope who was elected in this, in this whole string of events here. And St. Vincent Ferrer, another very great saint, owed his allegiance to the so-called Pope in Avignon. Well, as it turns out, the Church did eventually settle this issue and it declared that Pope Urban was the true Pope who was elected in Rome, and that the French cardinals who broke away to elect another pope, <coughs> claiming that there was something wrong with the original election, were wrong. And that the, the popes whom, the, the false popes whom they put in place were never really true popes. Um, because of the confusion of the time, though, uh, they were not denounced as anti-popes by the church, and their followers were not denounced as schismatics, even though they were following someone who was not truly the pope. Because of the confusion of the time, uh, they were looked upon as of, of being of goodwill and not having any formal, you know, um, evil in their intentions. You know, 
uh, they were just trying to make the best of a very difficult situation. Now here we are today when the modernists have uh, basically hijacked the institutions of the Roman Catholic Church uh, to give the church a, a, a makeover, as it were, along the lines of the modern world. I mean, this is what John the Twenty-Third said he was going to do uh, in so many words when he said, make the church relevant, make the church uh, modern, bring the church into the modern world, a giornamento, bring the church up to date. Um, these are all modernist slogans, <clears throat> and the idea is that the modern world knows the right way to God, and the church somehow had lost the way, so we had to revise the church, which really, as it turned out, boiled down at Vatican II to revising the faith, revising the religion, uh, the way Catholics practice their faith, and even re revising the worship of God, uh, giving us a new Mass, which is not just a, another Mass, it is kind of an anti-Mass. It is meant to be a replacement for the true Mass. Uh, the tr true Mass is the sacrifice of Calvary. It not only remembers that Jesus died for us on the cross, but it says, this is the sacrifice that Jesus offered on Calvary right here and now. And whereas the new Mass remembers that Jesus died for us on the cross, but never claims to be that sacrifice. It is simply a memorial of that sacrifice. Very big difference. So uh, <clears throat> here you have now a problem. This could not have happened without the collusion of popes because the Pope's primary responsibility is to protect the faith and to protect the church, to protect the religion, and to protect the souls of the faithful from exactly the things that the modernisms, modernists were out to do. That's why Pope Pius, the 12, Pope Pius X in 1907 issued his encyclical condemning modernism. He was functioning as a real Pope should, defending the Catholic faith and defending the Catholic faithful. But Pope Pius X warned that there were reformers who were at work inside the church thinking that they were going to save the church by changing her and bringing her up to date and making her relevant to the modern world. <coughs> uh, Pope Pius X actually warned against the very things that John the XXIII, uh, Paul VI, and John, the 20, John Paul II have done. Uh, he actually predicted what they did and predicted their consequences for the church and said it would be very, very dangerous and very, very, very dire straits for the church when they got their way. And it, of course, uh, in that encyclical, he um, identified modernism as a, a heresy. Well, actually, he did more than that. He said it was the synthesis of all heresies. He said it is, it is the collection of all the heresies rolled into one big denial. He said it didn't just attack an article of faith, it attacks faith, the very virtue of faith in the soul of the person. It destroys all faith. Can one say then, Father, or logically conclude that uh, if this is, uh, as, as Pius X unequivocally stated, the heresy and the synthesis of all heresies, kind of the apex heresy, if you will, um, can one conclude that uh, adherents of, of modernism are themselves heretics? Well, um, modernist principles are very deadly to the faith. But uh, writers on modernism, good writers, have said that one can hold modernist principles and yet not have gotten to the logical conclusion of those principles. We tend to be fairly illogical mm -hmm. <clears throat> in the way we actually apply principles. And so somebody can hold certain modernist principles and yet have not gotten to the point where he has entirely lost his faith. You know, where he's weakening in his faith, he's loosening, his, his faith is beginning to, to, uh, to, uh, to weaken, show the signs of strain because logic would dictate that his faith must uh, yield to his modernist conclusions. And yet he hasn't taken modernism to its ultimate conclusions. So he might hold modernist uh, principles and yet not have reached the, the level of apostasy. But that's where it logically leads. Mm -hmm. And um, so we, here we have a situation now where we have popes who have actually been modernists themselves. They are modernists. And that raises the question, if they are modernists and they have modernist principles and they're spearheading the modernist attack on the church, they're basically betraying the church to the modernist uh, modernist uh, reformers, 
can these men really be popes? Can they be vicars of Christ on earth? Can they be successors of St. Peter? Uh, some would say no. <clears throat> some would say they can't be popes. Uh, Monsignor Paul F. Marceau, who was one of the early traditional Catholic priests in the country, a, uh, an army chaplain uh, of the, the strongest, startest, stoutest vintage, <coughs> would say, I'm not saying that Paul VI isn't the Pope. I just don't see how he can be the Pope, <laughs> he would say. <laughs> and actually, at the time, I thought, well, that's a peculiar thing to say. But the more I think about it now, the more I realize, well, that really states the dilemma. I mean, how can anyone say, you know, on his own authority that, you know, this man is the Pope, this man isn't the Pope. I mean, who has the authority to say that, to make that judgment? But at the same time, he has to say, well, I, I don't see how he can be the Pope after what he's done and the principles he's enunciated that are so non-Catholic or even anti-Catholic. Um, you see, it's, it's difficult to, uh, to pinpoint this because with modernists, what they say is one thing. Um, modernists are contradictory in what they say. Their fundamental principle that each man experiences God basically in his own way, and that's called his faith experience, well, a modernist could not say that traditional Catholicism is false. Any more than a modernist could say Buddhism is false, or Calvinism is false, or maybe even atheism is false. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. um, because we each experience God in our own way. God reveals himself to each of us in his own way. And so, uh, like the modernists would really have no problem with the traditional mass and the traditional Catholic religion. They would be glad to welcome traditional Catholics into their modernist church as long as traditional Catholics could just give up one idea. And that one idea is that there's one true God who has one true Son, Jesus Christ, who is the one true Lord and Savior, and the only Lord and Savior, who has taught us one true faith and has given us one true church, which, you know, uh, espouses one true religion. If we could get over that idea of there being one truth <clears throat> and just agree with them that, well, that's our faith experience, and that's true for us. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's only true for us. God manifests himself in many different ways, and they're all true. So traditional Catholicism is true, but then modernist Catholicism is true too. Buddhism is true. Calvinism is all true. Uh, Lutheranism is true. Uh, you know, right, uh, Shinto is true. Uh, Taoism is true. They're all true because they all represent valid faith experiences. If we traditional Catholics could simply drop our, uh, our, our hang-up, as it were, that there is one true Lord, one faith, one baptism, and uh, one true religion that leads to heaven. And uh, let's face it, you need to uh, have the grace of Jesus Christ in your soul to be saved, and without Jesus Christ you cannot be saved. Uh, as long as we hold to that, we cannot find a, a, a comfortable corner or niche in the modernist pantheon. And the, when I say pantheon, I mean pantheon. They include all the mm -hmm. gods, um, except ours. And, and this is why the Roman Empire would not acknowledge Jesus Christ, because he would not share divinity with all of the other gods of Rome and its conquered peoples. And so the Roman Senate would never approve the worship of Jesus Christ and the acknowledgement of him as the founder of a religion and the Son of God, because he, he, one, he says he's the only true God, and the Son of the only true God. That disqualified him immediately. Mm. And so it is today with the, the modernists, they disqualify this claim of our Lord, that he is the only true Savior and the only true Son of the only true God. And he alone teaches the truth, and no one can come to the Father but by me. And uh, Jesus said, no one can come to me except the Father call him. Now these are exclusionary ideas, uh, that the modernists absolutely reject. Um, so they would have no trouble, trouble with the traditional mass, they'd have no trouble with the traditional catechism, except there's one teaching, that there's no salvation without Jesus Christ. Now, um, Benedict XVI would not come out and, and say this flatly, 
But modernists don't necessarily come out and say this flatly. It's what they do that is the killer. Because a modernist will contradict himself left and right. He'll talk about the glories of traditional, the traditional Catholic faith, how beautiful the rosary is, how wonderful the traditional mass is in Latin, and so on. He'll, he'll kind of uh, uh, incense all of those things, uh, you know, as a sort of form of respect. But then he'll talk about the glories of Buddhism and the glories of, uh, of the Enlightenment, uh, the glories of the French Revolution and all the rest, too. So he contradicts what he says, but what he does is where you find the poison. <clears throat> For example, at this recent World Youth Day, mm -hmm. Uh, Benedict the Sixteenth is talking about the Eucharist, the Eucharist. He might have even called it the Holy Eucharist. They've gotten away from that, but he might have even called it the Holy Eucharist. And conservative modern Catholics would say, oh, isn't that wonderful? The Holy Father calls the Eucharist holy. It has come so far that they consider this to be a good sign. But, but you see, <clears throat> you have hundreds of thousands of young people kind of sacked out on the ground having slept through the night together, young men, young women, side by side, uh, Catholic, non-Catholic, <clears throat> and they're handing out hosts to everybody who comes up and puts his hands out. Mm. And how is this respectful to the Eucharist? Yeah. And what does it mean? Um, in the practical order, you see them doing this, and, and, and what does that tell you? It tells you that it doesn't mean anything to them. The same with, um, the, at the funeral of John Paul II, Cardinal Ratzinger, who presided, had brought up to him a Protestant leader, Brother Roger, the, leader of, uh, the former leader of the Teze ecumenical community. But Brother Roger was a Protestant leader, a worldwide, world-recognized Protestant leader. And uh, Benedict XVI gives him Holy Communion. What does this mean? And at uh, Brother Roger's funeral, he passed away. He was actually murdered recently at the age of 90. Mm -hmm. At his funeral, modernist Catholic priests, uh, clergymen, with Protestants were indiscriminately handing out wafers to anybody and everybody who came up, regardless of what religion they professed, if any at all. And so in action, you see modernism it doesn't mean anything. It, it, that's the point. Nothing means anything. It's uh, whatever basically goes along with the modern mentality, that's the true religion. And the modern mentality is, don't believe any supernatural truths. Uh, the wafer goes to everybody because you, you can't possibly offend anybody. That's the modern religion. Um, the, uh, getting back to this idea, though, of, uh, of sede vacantism and the effect of, of, of modernism, the synthesis of all heresies um, on... Um, <coughs> The, 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 the Sea of Peter itself. First of all, to give some historical context, this notion of the, 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 the Sea of Peter, the Vicar of Christ, being vacant or unoccupied is not something that has, that it has been contemplated before by uh, church saints and theologians and so yes, on. I mean, right. this is, I've mentioned this to conservative mm -hmm. uh, modernist friends of mine, and, and they say to even contemplate the idea is something that they would just it's it's inconceivable to them, and in fact, uh, it would almost be kind of a deal breaker for them as Catholics that they could no longer he would even be a Catholic if this was even possible. Yet it's been kind of considered in in uh, by previous thinkers from centuries past, um, and they've come to some conclusions about about well, this. Well, there as well. there have been as many periods of sede vacantism as there have been popes, because every time a pope dies, it's sede vacante. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there is no pope until another one is elected. Mm -hmm. Uh, whether it's a matter of days, weeks, or months, or in some cases years. What is unusual about this case is if the sea were to be vacant because, well, let's face it, I mean, if they don't have the faith, if you're not a member of the church, you can't be the head of the church. Mm -hmm. And to be a member of the Roman Catholic Church, you, you, you can't be an apostate. You have to have the, the Catholic faith. You know? So um, the, um, what, what separates this period is the length of time. In 40 years, 50 years. It's, uh, but why would 50 years be any different from three years mm -hmm. or two years? I mean, if the church can exist for a minute without a pope, why couldn't the church continue to exist for a decade or a generation without mm -hmm. a pope? There's no intrinsic reason why not. The problem, the thing that concerns me is this. The, the mechanism we have for having a pope is the College of Cardinals. 
And the cardinals are appointed by a pope, and he has to be a true pope to appoint them. If there's a, a fraudulent pope who appoints cardinals, they're fraudulent cardinals. But then when he dies, who's going to elect a true pope? Mm -hmm. You can't have a college of fraudulent cardinals, non-cardinals, electing a true pope. So it seems to me like you've cut off that succession line. Now, clearly, I mean, the, the mechanism of the College of Cardinals is a, it was adopted by the church. It wasn't always the case. The cardinals symbolically represent the clergy of Rome because the pope is the bishop of Rome. And the, the cardinals represent the priests of Rome who originally would gather and the death of one of the bishops of Rome, the pope, and would elect a successor. And so the cardinal's election is, is rather symbolic, that's true. Mm -hmm. But let's face it, Jim, I mean, really, when it comes right down to it in the practical order, without the College of Cardinals, or if the College of Cardinals is full of, of fake cardinals, uh, you do have a practical problem of, of where any successor of Peter would come from, who would be, would be recognizable by everyone in the world. It would almost take a miracle from God to provide a pope so that you know, everybody who had the faith would recognize this. He is the true Roman pontiff, the true vicar of Christ on earth now. I don't have an answer for that. Mm -hmm. And that is why when it comes to state of Vicantism, I, I treat rather lightly with it because um, I would agree with Monsignor Marceau when it came to Paul VI and John Paul II. I'm not saying he's not the Pope. I just don't see how he could be after what he's done to the church um, and the principles that he's espoused and the things not only that he's taught but the things that he hasn't taught. That, that failure is a very glaring thing. But at the same time, uh, I, I think logically you could conclude with the principles as we understand them, as the church has given to them, to us, and the facts as we know them, that there's a strong logical argument that Paul VI and John Paul II were not true valid popes. But having said that, that I think you could make a strong logical argument for it, a theological, mm -hmm. not just logical, but a <clears throat> theological argument for it. I also have to stress that there's no one alive who has the authority to make that judgment. He can make a theological argument for it. He might even say that I am convinced that they were not true popes. But he cannot say that that's the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. He can't say that's a dogma of the faith. He can say that's my opinion. And I consider it to be the only logical position to hold. But it still comes down to his own theological opinion. And I think one is entitled to that opinion today, mm -hmm. frankly, yeah. um, because of the confusion. Uh, we have an example uh, during the, uh, the great Western schism that I mentioned that the church did not call people who followed the false popes in Avignon non-Catholics or schismatics because of the confusion of the time. I think we're very much back in that confusion, even more so now. So I think we have to give each other some slack. And th this is a very topical issue because there's been an assault recently by the modernist, uh, let's say modern, uh, it's hard to define these people. They're traditional insofar as they want the traditional mass, uh, but they claim to have an allegiance to Benedict XVI and John Paul II. They say they're popes absolutely popes. You can't deny they're popes. You can't even question that they are truly popes. And therefore, they, although they style themselves traditional Catholics because they hold to the traditional mass for the most part, they turn against the traditional Catholics who are sede vacantis, and they attack them and almost as, as, as viciously as they attack the Novus Ordo. They attack other traditional Catholics who hold to the traditional faith uh, for being sede vacantis, and that's wrong. First of all, they misrepresent them very badly. There are, there are some sede vacantis who are dogmatic sede vacantis. Uh, I don't even consider them to be traditional Catholics, though. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are some who will say, John Paul II was no pope. I can prove it. It's a matter of faith. And if you believe he was the pope, you're not a Catholic. Hmm. And I don't even consider those people to be traditional Catholics at all mm -hmm. because they're usurping authority they don't have. Mm -hmm. um, if, but if you find someone who says, well, I personally am a sede vacantist, meaning I personally am convinced by the power of the arguments 
uh, theologically, I just don't see how uh, John Paul II or Benedict XVI espousing the principles that they do and having actually put them into practice, doing the things they do, uh, could have the Catholic faith and therefore be the, you know, the head of the Catholic Church on earth. Um, you might argue the point with them if you disagree with them, but you can't say they're not Catholics <clears throat> for holding that theological opinion. Um, but those, on the other hand, who say, well, they are popes, and you cannot question that they're popes, well, then they have a lot of answering to do. And, and this is a problem on the Sede Vicantis side that I think is very powerful. And that is, if you're telling me that all of these things that these men have done, changing all the rites of the sacraments, uh, introducing a new rite of mass that doesn't even claim to be the sacrifice of Calvary, and using that to try to eradicate the true mass, and all of the other things they've done. And you say there's nothing so serious that you would say that there's no argument for even doubting the fact that they're true popes, in spite of the fact that they claim to use the power of the papacy to introduce and enforce all these things. And you reject these things that they've done and won't obey them in these things. That's how seriously wrong you see these things are. You're living a contradiction here. You're saying what they've done is so serious you must reject it on the strength that to remain Catholic. And yet, nothing is so serious that it would even raise a question mark as to whether they're true popes. That doesn't work with me. And uh, see, as a state of a contest, I would have very serious problems with that because I would say, the papacy is such an exalted institution, comes to us from Jesus Christ. You cannot say that somebody is absolutely a true pope and then totally disregard every command he gives. That is schismatic. See, this is the problem that the, the, non, the anti sede have. Mm -hmm. uh, they feel that they're free to disobey uh, someone they recognize as, as a true supreme pontiff in virtually everything, and there are no consequences to that. There is a dilemma here, Jim, and the point is it takes a lot of humility. God is humbling us all and making us realize there's a limit to what we can know, but we will have to simply practice the Catholic faith in its entirety now. We know that's true. No one can make that wrong. Well, Father, these are indeed times of, uh, of unprecedented confusion, and uh, it, our human intellects will probably not uh, ever, ever figure it out, and it will be only through the grace of God uh, that these problems are resolved and the truth, the truth will be revealed. Again, thank you for joining us on the program and uh, for giving us your insights uh, uh, on this topic. Um, I hope that we can discuss it again in the future as well. Thank you for joining What Catholics Believe. Please join us again next week.